Hello, chess fans. According to international master and chess writer Israel Horowitz, the match held in 1951 between the world champion Mikhail Batvinik and the challenger David Branstein was perhaps the most interesting match ever played for the world championship. End of quote. The match represented a fierce battle between the two antipodes. While the patriarch of Soviet chess Batvinik played orthodox positional chess and was the incarnation of order, logic, correctness and rationality, Branstein was a highly dynamic and tactical player, known for his creativity and resourcefulness. Another peculiarity of this match was that Batvinik didn't take part in chess competitions after becoming a world champion in 1948 and didn't play a single tournament game in three years as he worked on his doctoral dissertation. Branstein, however, claimed that Batvinik hadn't played because he didn't want to reveal his opening secrets. Although he didn't play a single tournament game in three years, Batvinik prepared for the match properly by studying the literature, analyzing Branstein's recent games, and playing training games. Branstein, in his turn, earned the right to challenge the reigning champion after his brilliant victory in 1950 Candidates Tournament in Budapest, where he overcame the strongest grandmasters of that time, such as Keres, Smyslov, and Boleslavsky, among others. The conditions of the match were simple. The winner would be the first to score 12 and half points from a maximum of 24 games, while the champion would retain the title in case of a draw. In this video series, I'm gonna cover each of these 24 games, and in this initial video, we will analyze the first game of the match. Batvinik played white pieces and started with d4, and Branstein played e6. Uh, immediately starting the psychological duel. Branstein shows his readiness to play both the French defense, in case Batvinik plays e4 with his next move, and the Dutch, in case Batvinik plays c4. Batvinik was considered an expert in both of these openings and won many brilliant games with black uh, playing the Dutch and the French defenses. Branstein writes in his annotations that it was psychologically important uh, for him to demonstrate to his opponent and to the whole world that he felt at home playing Batvinik's favorite openings. Batvinik, in his turn, writes in his annotations that Branstein wanted to force him to fight against his own opening systems and called this strategy naive. It's worth mentioning that Branstein was just 27 years old, while Batvinik was 39. So, Batvinik chose c4, and Branstein played the Dutch defense. g3, knight f6, bishop g2, bishop e7, knight c3, castle kingside, e3, d6. So, this uh, position reminds, uh, this structure for black reminds King's Indian defense, with the only difference that the bishop is on e7 instead of g7. Knight e2, c6, castle kingside, and e5. So both players in their annotations agree that this position is absolutely equal and white uh, doesn't have um, any opening advantage. Batvinik played d5, crossing the border, the central, uh, the center, and exerting some pressure. And queen e8. This is a typical move in the Dutch. Uh, the queen is heading to h5, exerting pressure on the kingside e4, queen h5, e takes f, bishop takes f5. Now black has a couple of threats. First, bishop h3, followed by knight g4, and after exchange on uh, g2, just checkmate on h2. The second threat is e4, followed by knight d7, knight e5, and knight f3 check. So in order to parry both of these threats, Batvinik played f3 taking under control e4 square and g4 square. Now, now knight g4 is impossible. f3 also ensures the development of the bishop. Now bishop can move to e3 without being disturbed by the knight on uh, g4. Besides that, f3 created a threat. g4 would be a fork. That's why Branstein played queen g6. Now the fight would go around the central uh, blockading square on e4 very important square. As you see, black uh, exerts pressure with a knight, bishop, and queen, while white uh, defends it with a bishop, pawn, and a knight. Bishop e3, knight d7, queen d2, c takes d. So in these kind of positions, um, players usually 
try to capture on uh, on d5 with a piece rather than with a pawn in order to keep the d file open on which um, the opponent has a backward pawn on d6 the weakness so that uh, after while the line is open uh, you can always exert pressure with rooks and uh, queen on this um, pawn however in this position it doesn't work if batvinik captured with a knight and after knight takes d5 with a queen so that the line remains open uh, with check black would have just played uh, bishop e6 attacking the queen and it turns out that the uh, weakness of d6 uh, pawn isn't so important as white cannot exploit it while black attacks the c4 uh, pawn and uh, white uh, has uh, difficulties in uh, defending it so that's why instead of knight takes uh, d5 but Vinik captured with a pawn however now the d file is closed and uh, the d6 pawn isn't backward anymore and white cannot attack it uh, on a d file here, Brandstein played bishop d8 in order to activate the bishop, which isn't really doing anything at the moment and is limited by its own pawn on d6. So, Brandstein wanted, by playing bishop d8, to reroute it either to b6, exchanging it for a very good bishop on e3, or to a5, pinning the knight, which defends the pawn and also controls a very important e4 square. And uh, Batvinik, in his annotations, gives this uh, move an exclamation mark to, to bishop d8. However, Branstein, uh, on the contrary, writes that this move is premature and it would be better to play h5 first instead of bishop d8, first to play h5 in order to prevent g4 once and for all, and only then, with the next move, play bishop d8. So, bishop d8, and here, uh, uh, Batvinik missed his opportunity to play g4. As Batvinik, uh, Branstein didn't play h5, now it was time to play g4, attacking the bishop, and after bishop d3, rook d1, attacking it again, and forcing it uh, to move away from this very important diagonal, on which it controlled a very important uh, blockading square on e4. And after bishop a6, white could have played knight g3, taking under full control this important blockading square on e4. Instead of this, instead of g4, Batvinik made a mistake. Both players agree in the annotations that this is a passive move. Rook c1. And Branstein plays bishop a5, pinning the knight. And now, uh, white would love to play rook d1 first, taking under control d3 square, and then g4, so that the bishop cannot move to d3. However, now it doesn't work. If white played rook d1, then Branstein was going to play knight b6, threatening knight c4 with a fork, and if g4, then still knight c4, ignoring the attack of the bishop, and after g takes f, just captures the pawn, and it turns out that uh, the bishop falls anyway. After the queen retreats, uh, black would capture the bishop with a knight and would have a better position. So that's why, as there is no time for rook d1, uh, Batvinik played g4 immediately, attacking the bishop. Now, uh, bishop d3 followed, rook d1 attacking the bishop, and bishop c4 attacking the pawn. Uh, and although uh, Batvinik managed to push this bishop away, from this important diagonal, still uh, black has a very strong pressure. Uh, both black bishops are very strong, very active. d5 is under attack. Black is also threatening uh, to play e4, so as the defender of e4 square, the knight is pinned anyways. Uh, so there are multiple threats, and uh, in order to ease the pressure, Batvinik was forced to offer the exchange of queens by playing queen c2. And Branstein agreed and exchanged the queens and played knight b6, attacking the pawn for the third time. So now black is threatening to capture the pawn. That's why Batvinik played rook d2, defending it. And here Branstein had an opportunity to exchange both of his great bishops for bad knights in order to uh, get almost winning endgame. 
However, in his annotations, he writes that uh, he just didn't feel like uh, exchanging these great bishops for very bad knights. So it was against his artistic nature to play so pragmatically. But he gives the following variation. He could have played bishop takes e2 first, exchanging the first bishop for the knight. And after, uh, of course, the knight cannot capture because it's pinned. So after rook takes e2, exchanging the second bishop for the knight. And now, of course, white cannot capture the bishop because d5 would fall. That's why first uh, white would be forced to capture on b6. And after a takes b, b takes c, we can see that although black exchanged both of his great bishops, white has a lot of weaknesses. Isolated pawn on a2, backward pawn on c3, backward pawn on f3, and all of these weaknesses can be attacked uh, by black rooks, very active rooks, while white rooks are very passive and aren't doing anything. And with his next strong positional move, g5, black would have fixed white pawns on light squares. Now white won't be able to play f4 or g5. The bishop would be eternally bad. The knight would be much stronger than the bishop. And the only weakness that black has in case white attacks it uh, can be easily defended by knight d7. And this knight also can be rerouted to very strong um, post on c5. So black would have almost winning position in this case. However, Brandstein uh, couldn't uh, go against his nature and play pragmatically and instead played bishop a6, vacating c4 square for the knight. Still, he still has advantage because knight uh, c4 would be a fork. And that's why Batvinik played bishop f2, moving the bishop from e3 so that uh, knight c4 isn't fork anymore. And here Brandstein misses his last opportunity to fight for initiative. He could have played e4, threatening to advance this pawn even further with a fork, uh, forcing white to capture. And after bishop takes e3, of course, knight c4 again would be a fork attacking both the bishop, the rook, and also b2. However, instead of this, Brandstein played knight c4, what he was planning to play, attacking the rook, but now just rook c2, bishop b6, exchanging the bishops, bishop takes b6, a takes b. Now uh, knight e3 is threatened with a fork, that's why Batvinik played rook e1, still knight e3, rook d2, knight c4, rook c2, knight e3, and the position was repeated three times as um, Brandstein was in a serious time trouble. He had to agree to the repetition and Batvinik claimed a draw. So in the first game of this match, uh, although Brandstein had uh, initiative and advantage, he didn't manage to exploit it. So I'd be grateful if you like this video to help me with the channel growth and see you in the analysis of the second game of this interesting match.